How many of you are from a different country? Now, here's my, okay, everyone from a different country, raise your hand. Okay, we have these, these individuals from different countries. Okay, now what, what I want you to do before I have Rich come to see you is I want you to actually, um, I want you to think about a word that they have in the country that you came from. But when you came into America, that word did not mean the same thing. And so it could cause a problem in conversation. Does somebody have one of those words? Okay, okay, stand, stand up if you have a word that's like that. You have a word that's like that? Okay, see that gentleman there, Rich? Well, you know, one of the words that I thought about, one of the words that I thought about was, I thought about the word for a trunk when I go to England. They call it a what? A boot. So when they say, well, you know, I'm going to put this in the boot, and I pick up my shoe, <laughs> and I look at it, and I think, you're going to put that in my boot. First off, I can't hardly understand the guy. We're separated by a common language. That, but they, you know, here, I'm looking, and I said, you, you're going to put that in your, you can't put that in your boot. The thing is huge. I mean, you, you, you just have to be able to do that. And so what happens is, is that we don't, you know, we have a, a challenge with, with different, um, you know, with different terminologies and what people mean about things. Sir. Can we have that, Carl? We go, is, is it on? How's that? No? Let's go. Just holler it to me. Just scream it at me. A biscuit, a biscuit, so a, a cookie's a biscuit, you know, that's a problem for me, Be that is a real issue for me, thank you so much, the cookie is a biscuit, you know, to me, I mean, how many of you, when you think about a biscuit, you think about a Kind of a white hockey puck. That's kind of like when you think about a biscuit. But, but it is. But you know what else too is that American cookies are many times different than cookies you buy in other countries. Because we love sugar. I think that a cookie without sugar... is only used if you want to dry something up in your stomach. It's not, it, it has absolutely no purpose beyond any of that. Rich, do we have somebody else? Okay, great. Luke. I may have been looking for a biscuit, but I have also been looking for a room called WC, and I couldn't find it anywhere. A WC. A WC. How many of you know what a WC is? All right, there's several of us. The rest of you guys, and the rest of you guys, it's really a bathroom, but I, I was coming over, but <laughs> Veronica's from South Africa, and in South Africa, they call a WC a what? A loo. A loo. How do you spell that? L-O-O. -O. So if you are a little bit confused or you have trouble with spelling, you could actually say, hello. <laughs> hello. You know, you don't want to do that. But say, thanks, Rich. Thank you very much. But, you know, we have a lot of words that they mean something different. And we can almost get around things that mean different things. But what it is is that we have trouble at times with overanalyzing. How many of you have ever overanalyzed something? Somebody has said something and all, all of a sudden they didn't really mean a whole bunch by it, but what happened was you ended up 
just taking that thing so far that now you need counseling. <laughs> All over the fact that this thing has gone further than it's needed to go. You know, that's, that's one thing. I mean, how about this, girls? He told me he loved me. Well, have you figured out that maybe your idea of him telling you that he loved you and his idea of telling you that he loved you might not necessarily have been the piece of the puzzle that fit perfectly in that spot? Because you begin to ask questions like, well, what do you mean by that? Why do you, and a lot of times we overanalyze things. Have you ever been, really, really, now, if you've been guilty of overanalyzing something, raise your hand. Okay, this church of the whole truth today. So what, so we have that not only in our personal lives, but we also have that in the church. Let's just say, mention this one, I mean, demon possession. People start asking the question, and there are people in this room, you're kind of going, because you're going to overanalyze what I'm saying. Is that some people believe that a person can have a demon in their heart. Other, per other people believe that they can have a demon in their spirit. And they start asking the question, where do you believe that this demon is? Do you believe that a Christian can have a demon? I think, can a Christian have a demon? To myself, I start asking, I think it's a more relevant question to ask if a demon can have a Christian. But I just overanalyzed it. But what does it really matter whether or not that the demon is on a person's ear, whether the demon's in their heart, whether he's in his spirit, or whether he's in their atmosphere, or he is living inside of their house? Where does it really matter that the demon is as long as you get rid of him? Isn't that true? But we get caught over analyzing certain things, and there is one story in the New Testament that we've overanalyzed. And that story is the story of the woman with the alabaster box. Would you go with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 7. Luke, chapter 7, let's take a look at verse, beginning with verse number 36. Luke, chapter 7, verse number 36. In verse number 36, this is really kind of important, so since my iPad won't respond, I'm going to do all of this out of my head. In Luke chapter 7, verse number 36, let's begin there where he says this. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come to his home for a meal. So Jesus accepted the invitation to sit down and eat with him. Now, during this time, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stop for a minute and begin to explain something to you because you need to realize where this is. If what happens is, is that we just gloss over what happened when the woman with the alabaster box showed up, we won't really understand what the Lord is doing. And so here it is that Jesus was asked to come over to this religious man's house, one of the Pharisees. I want to say Pharisee. Pharisee. Now the word Pharisee just means separate. That's all that Pharisee means. It just means separate. So these people who are Pharisees believe that they are separate. So Jesus was asked by this Pharisee if what he was going to, if what he could do was come over to his house for dinner. Verse 37, it says, A certain immoral woman heard that he was there and brought a beautiful jar filled with expensive perfume. Now, this is huge. 
This is huge. Is that now you see Jesus goes to this man's house for dinner, but there's this immoral woman who hears that Jesus is there and she's able to go there. Now, the question is, how was she able to go there? How did she get in? She was uninvited. People didn't think about including her. There were so many different things that she was now experiencing inside of her mind. But the Bible says that when she heard that Jesus was there, she picked up this expensive vial or jar that was filled with perfume and then decided she was going to go off to Jesus. Verse 38. It says, then she knelt behind him. Now let me kind of explain to you this house that she was in. When, in fact, that they had dinner, most often they had dinner on the outside of the house when a guest would come. The reason why that they would almost have the American barbecue was just so that people from the neighborhood could come in. But they came in for two reasons. They came in, A, because the person who owned the house wanted to show to everyone how influential that they were by the individual they could ask to come over for dinner. That they must be cool if this person's willing to come. But also, they wanted the people that were living in the community to be able to pick up a lot of knowledge in business and understanding and relationships so that they could get people to quit stealing from each other or to say that things were mine, they weren't really yours or that they are at a place where they said, you know, you moved the, you moved the landline. You never should have done that. You really were acting um, not only imperfectly, but you were acting sinfully toward me. So as this woman came, what happened was, just see yourself walking up to a door. When you walked up to the door, the door didn't necessarily go into the house, but when you opened it, it actually opened into a courtyard. Houses were built in a square, and they were built in a square for this very reason. The reason of being able to have dinners with individuals from the neighborhood. And so this woman, after Jesus was in the center of all of this, that Jesus was in the center having dinner, there were people that lined outside of where the dinner was, not having dinner with anyone, but actually listening to the conversation. When they listened to the conversation, things somewhat heated up. But let's read the rest of this without any commentary. She knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisees saw who was the host, or was, who was, the host saw what was happening and who the woman was, he said to himself, this proves, this actually proves that Jesus is no prophet. If God had really sent him, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. Because she is a sinner. Then Jesus spoke up and answered his thoughts and said, Simon, as he said to the Pharisee, he said, I have something that I'd like to say to you. He said, all right, teacher. He said, please. Simon replied, go ahead. He said, then Jesus told him the story. He said, a man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver, day's wage, 500 days wages. So actually a guy got a year and a half's worth of wages that he borrowed from this man. And this next man that he lent money to had only received 50 that he had borrowed. So one guy got a year and a half's wages. So think of yourself. If you make, you know, $50,000 a year or 75000 or let's make it 
a hundred. If you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, then what it was was this man had lent a hundred and fifty thousand dollars to this person. And to the other one, he lent fifty thousand dollars. So he said, but neither of them could repay him. Isn't that the way it goes? Neither of them could repay him. What a revelation. Neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both. Do you know, after time, what happens is, when an individual doesn't really come through with all that they say that they were going to do, the best thing to do is for you to rip it up. It's gone don't think about it anymore because you're living in bitterness. You don't know what to do with what's happening with you. And so it's better for you just to let it go. He said, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debt. He said, who do you suppose loved him more after that? He said, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt or the one that he forgave more. That's right, Jesus said. He said, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. He said, when I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has not ceased, or she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. He said, you didn't give me a kiss of greeting, but she has kissed my feet again and again from the first time that I came in. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you her sins, and they are many, that they have been forgiven. He said, for she has shown me much love. But a person who has forgiven little only shows a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins, your sins, they're forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who does this thing? Who is the one who, who thinks that he can turn around and he can actually forgive sins? Then Jesus said to the woman, your faith. Everyone say, your faith. Your faith. He said, your faith has saved you. This story is probably the most overanalyzed story in all of the scriptures because it has to do with someone's worship and the understanding of this. Is a person forgiven because they love? Or does a person love because they are forgiven? It's a question that's very difficult for people to, to figure out. But let me kind of answer that one for you right away because it's really important for you to know. In verse number 50, once again, Jesus said this to the woman. He said, woman, you're what? Faith. Say it again. Faith. Say it again. Faith. So remember that the reason why that she loved Jesus as much as she did was because she believed that Jesus had forgiven her of so much. And so Jesus said to Simon, he said, you know, Simon, if a person only thinks that they've been forgiven for little, they only love a little bit. But if a person believes that they've been forgiven for much, you can't stop them. What I'd first like to do is I'd like to show you a picture of how this woman, the Bible says that she came behind Jesus. Take a look at this picture because I want to show you the way that they ate. If you take a look over here at this screen, you can begin to see the way that they ate because this is a picture of how they ate in Jesus' day. What they had were they had tables that were in front of them and then they had couches that were at the same level of the table and they would lay down with their feet all the way at the end of their couch and lay forward for them to be able to eat. It seems to me crazy. And there also are no forks. 
So whatever it is, just kind of, and they, they were just so gross. They ate with their hands and stuff like that and smacked. And I have never seen a napkin at all. I didn't see one napkin. I didn't see anything. But you know the napkins are all, you have to ask yourself, here's trivia for you. Is the reason why that Britain actually had come out with napkins the way that they had done to actually influence the world on napkins, is that because when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, Jesus folded up the napkin <laughs> in the tomb? I won't answer that question. You'll have to come back and get that at another time. But here we have it. Here you find all of these people laying around the table. And as they're laying around the table, their feet are all, way, are all behind them at the end. And the Bible says that this woman came in. And when she came in, she was behind Jesus. Jesus had his back to this woman the whole time. He had his back to this woman the whole time that she actually was even performing on him all of the things that she was. His back was to her. So she begins to come out of the crowd. She comes off the sides of the building. She goes beyond the guardrail that would stop people from mingling with the people who were there for dinner. She breaks through that and she begins to cry. Now what's interesting is, is that how do you have a prostitute cry? She has resisted every bit of emotion. She has had to shut herself off from all emotions in order to be able to become a prostitute. As I listened to a story concerning prostitutes just recently, this one woman who had now become a prostitute to be able to take care of her children, what she said was, was that she did it and that she could actually break into this alter ego to this other personality that would actually allow her to be a mother and to care for her children and to do all of the things that a mother would do. But the moment that she had to go to work, she began to get the lipstick. She began to get the different tools of her trade. And as she was putting on her lipstick one day, her son came down and was watching her prepare to become this woman of the night. And he said to his mommy, he said, Mommy, he said, Mommy, where are you, Mommy? Where are you? She said, Baby, she said, I'm right here. He said, No, Mommy, no, you're not here. You're not there. Because she took on a whole nother life. And he knew it people know. And so this woman who had all of these challenges now had come and broken through the crowd and came and knelt down at the backside of Jesus. How did she get over all the looks that the people had when she walked in the room? How did she get past the people that were attempting to stop her? How did she actually face off with the fact that the closer she got to the center of the room, the closer that she was to Simon, and Simon hated her because he was separate. One of the greatest challenges that we have is we don't know how to balance ourselves in our separation from the things of the world. Many times what happens is, is that we begin to pick up an attitude of superiority that we don't really believe. Actually, once you know Jesus, you realize that you're less than even the guy that never met him at all. But the people who are in the world think that we think that we, that we are better than they are. No, my recognition of Jesus is proof 
that I believe I'm not quite as good as those people because they can still live life without him. So this woman, she breaks through the crowd. She gets to the place where the people are eating and she falls at the back where Jesus' feet were and she begins to cry. And when she cries, all of the pent-up tears of all of her life have now, are now coming out because the Bible said that she could actually wash Jesus' feet with the amount of tears that came. So here it was. She's washing the feet of Jesus. The whole time she's washing his feet, she's crying and crying and crying and crying and as she's crying and she's kissing his feet kissing and crying and kissing and crying and no doubt everyone in the room was exceedingly uncomfortable because of something was happening that they knew nothing about. Do you know that the Bible doesn't say at all that there was one other person that came to that dinner that night that was affected at all? You can walk in a room with Jesus and Jesus can be in all of his glory and only one person out of a million even recognizes who he is. But as she's crying and washing his feet with her tears and drying them with her hair, it's very interesting to believe that the Bible says that the glory of a woman is her hair. She wiped the feet of Jesus with all the dirt and the dung and everything else that Jesus had picked up on his feet. She washed not only the top of his feet, she washed the bottom of his feet as well. And she's wiping his feet with her hair. And as she's wiping his feet with her hair, she's continually kissing him. And as she's kissing him, she's beginning to pour perfume upon his head. He still doesn't react. He doesn't move. Look with me, please, at the book of Proverbs, chapter 7. Let's begin with verse number 15 so we can see what is happening. In Proverbs, chapter 7, verse number 15, let's just give everyone a moment to be able to get there. Proverbs 7, verse number 15. Let's take a look and see. So I came out to meet you. This is the prostitute speaking. So I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face and I have found you. She said, verse 16, she said, I've spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. This woman who came to Jesus, took the tools of all of her prostitution and gave them to him. She gave up her ointment. She gave up her coverings. She gave up all of the things that she had been known for. She gave up her ability to make money. She gave up her ability to have an identity uh, and an attention from men that she now, for the rest of her life, will never get again. I was reading something about a young girl who actually, she was really the birthplace of where girls began to get sugar daddies. And 
and they, she was the original sugar baby. And what she did was she went into prostitution in order to pay her college tuition. When she went into prostitution to pay her college tuition, she now has said, this ruined me forever. While the world is saying, you know, it's a noble cause, what else are you going to do? The moment that she gets her tuition paid for, now she'll never be able to get a job all of her life because everybody knew who she was because the news media was so interested in being able to celebrate the girls that were industrious enough to be able to go out into prostitution so they could just make the money because you, insensitive and unthoughtful people, would not pay her free tuition, you wouldn't do it. So because you wouldn't do it, she had to go into prostitution. And now it's because of you, she'll never have a life. Oh, evil it is so evil. <laughs> Let's go back to the woman. So Simon sees this going on. When Simon sees this, the Bible says that he begins to think. And when he's thinking, he says this, and if this guy was a prophet, he would know who was touching him. He would know it. And he said, Simon, I've got something I want to talk to you about. He said, sure. You have a word from the Lord for me? I'm really open to be able to hear from God. I just want to hear what God has to say. He said, there was a story of two men and one generous one. This generous man lent 500 days wages to one man, 50 days wages to another man, but neither one of them could pay them back. Which man do you think loved him more? Simon. He says, well, you know, the one that has been forgiven more. That's it. And he said, Simon, you are so right. And at that particular moment, as Jesus was laying down, looking into the face of Simon, that was the last time that he looked at him. Because the Bible said that Jesus turned and looked at the woman. The first time Jesus ever looked at her. He turned and looked at the woman, and when he turned and looked at the woman, the Bible said he was still now speaking to Simon. Simon. See this woman? Her sins are many. Do you know, when Simon said Jesus didn't know what he was talking about, all you need to do is go through the story and Jesus was the prophet in both of their lives. He understood what was going on in Simon's heart. He understood what was happening when Simon spoke. He also understood that the sin that was going on inside of the life of this little girl was not the one that was evident to everyone else, but that there was something that was deeper that no one else had ever seen. And Jesus was dealing with that. He said, there's more, Simon. He said, you see her sins, there are many. But I'm telling you, that though her sins are many, she has been forgiven. Because he that has been forgiven much loves much. But he that's been forgiven little he only loves little. You'll see that woman again because she is an example 
of everything God ever wants out of every one of us. He's not looking for us to believe anything. He's looking for for you and I to put him in his rightful place. Because a person doesn't have faith, have faith because they love a lot. But a person loves a lot. They follow a lot. They don't have excuses. Because they have faith. We love because we have faith. When you were asking about someone in your family, someone will turn around and they'll say, you know, they love God. What do you mean? Only in your eyes. Faith comes before love. Love never comes before faith. This morning, we made this decision of being able to take this time. You know, usually once a year what we do is we we bring our gift to the Lord. This year, I didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do was I actually wanted to give all of us an opportunity to break our alabaster box over Jesus and pour ourselves over him. So this morning, it's our time to do that. Over these last number of weeks, I've been telling you that this is what we're going to do. And so what I want you to do is I want you to prepare your alabaster offering for the Lord. Just prepare that offering. If you're new or whatever else, this doesn't have anything to do with you. This has to do with people who know and are walking toward him. No one will ever know the cost of what you of what you gave to Jesus. Your life, what you walked through, and how much that you have been forgiven. I've been forgiven. When someone tries to tell me about what they can do, I never knew that there was anything that we could never do. What do you mean? You say we can't do this. What do you mean? We can do anything. Just remember whatever you do. is the proof of love that you display. Let's pray over this seed. Can you guys bring those things to me? Please stretch your hands toward this this morning. Father, thank you so much for these who have given. I'm asking you, Father, to multiply this seed sown. May the ointment and the fragrance from these seeds this morning, may they be the very things that 
Deliver those in the future. May their families, may their businesses, and may their lives be filled with you, with your presence, because they've broken the alabaster box for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. You can take those. Down.